Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us today for our Sunday service. If you're new here, welcome! We are so happy you're here and we would love to know who you are and answer any questions that you may have. The easiest way to get connected is to simply click the Get Connected link that is available on your platform. Also, before we jump into today's service, we wanted to take a couple minutes to let you know what you can expect each week here at Monterey Church. You see, we believe that the church isn't a building. It's not just a service that we attend once a week, but that the church is whenever and wherever his people are gathered together around the presence of God. That's why there are multiple opportunities for us to come together and to stay focused on God all week long. First, our Sunday service is the time where we all start our week together in order to focus on God and worship Him with songs through our generosity and the study of His Word. Don't worry if you aren't able to make it at 9 a.m. because the service is available on demand all week long. Additionally, we have different Sunday experiences for your kids depending on their ages, including your toddler through pre-K, elementary kids, middle schoolers, and even a midweek gathering for our high school students. In addition to the Sunday gathering, every Monday at noon, we come together over Zoom for a quick devotional and to spend some time together in prayer. This little lunchtime break is a great way to ensure that our hearts are aligned and ready to tackle the work week. Raise your hand if you love Worship Wednesdays. I know I do. So each Wednesday at 7 p.m., we are going to be worshiping the Lord together in some form on any of our online platforms. Now, this is gonna look different every week, some weeks it might be a full band leading us in worship. Sometimes it might be prayer and communion. Maybe it's a devotional and a brand new song. Whatever it looks like, you can expect that Worship Wednesdays will be a powerful touch point where you get to worship the Lord in the middle of your week. So we'll see you Wednesdays at 7 p.m. for Worship Wednesday. In addition to Sundays, Mondays, and Wednesdays, there are small groups that we call D groups or discipleship groups, which meet throughout the week. Our D groups are really the lifeblood of this family because they're where we get to know one another, it's where we discuss and apply the sermon, and it's really where we live life and have fun together. Some of our groups are currently meeting online through Zoom or Google Meets, and some are meeting in person, socially distanced. All of the information about our D groups and weekly gatherings, including the links to join these gatherings, can be found on our homepage at www.monterreychurchca.com. Additionally, another great way to stay focused on God and connected to one another is to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, and to subscribe to our weekly newsletter by clicking the Get Connected link. All right, service is about to begin. Now, we know things look different than we may have all hoped or expected, but we are grateful for this season as a time to really grow in our relationship to God and one another. So, before we jump into the service today, we really wanted to give you a minute to prepare. This is the time to maybe grab your Bible or your notebook. For some of you, your coffee or your tea. Uh, it may even be a good time to kind of look around your environment and get your family members together. Maybe even put those phones on mute. Um, in other words, this is a time, let's be intentional to really prepare not only our environments, but our hearts so that we can give God our best today. And also remember, although we're gathering remotely, and um, viewing a service online. This isn't entertainment or a program that we're just passively watching, but it's a time where we're entering into the presence of a holy and living God. So let's really lean into what Jesus wants to say to each of us individually, and let's treat this time as a sacred moment. Thank you. 
Hey church, thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Jedi. I'm the worship pastor here, and I'm just so excited for what the Lord has in store for us today. We're going to jump straight into worship, and uh, I just want to remind you before we jump in, um, I just want to challenge you a little bit. Um, This is a time that we get to set apart and focus all of our attention on the Lord. And so I just want to challenge you today. If you have anything that would like distract you from worship or hearing from God, I just invite you to put that aside for a moment, and uh, we're just going to worship together. So Uh, Let me pray for us, and then we'll jump in and we'll sing together. Father, we love you. We thank you for um, this time and this place where we can come and worship you, God, and give you all of our attention. And so, Father, we invite you right now into our space of worship, wherever we're at today. And I pray that you would challenge us, God, challenge us to engage in your presence today and what you have. And uh, we come into your presence very expectant, Lord, expectant for you to speak um, into our lives and... I just pray that we would be in a place where we can receive um, all that you have for us today. And so we give you this time, Lord. We give you this space. Um, Come and have your way, Lord. And uh, we just look to you today. We love you. And uh, we give you all of our worship in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, church, let's worship together.
Lord, that's our prayer today. We believe that there is no shame here in your presence, God, that fear has no place. And so wherever we're fearful, God, wherever we're doubtful, we pray that you would just erase those things, God, and replace it with your peace, replace it with your all-surpassing joy, God, and that you would just use this time to, um, to give us comfort, to give us peace. Lord, we love you so much. We worship you, God. Amen, amen. Church, this next song we're going to sing, I'm super excited about. Um, we've sang this before. It's called Let It Rise. And uh, it's just a song all about um, offering God our, our highest worship, our highest praise, and um, just laying everything down before his feet. And um, so wherever you're at today, I just invite you, let's go into the Lord's presence as um, we already are, and I just invite you to continue worshiping him and um, just laying it down before his feet. You know, he is so worthy of all of our praise, all of our adoration. So let's just worship him today.
Church, thank you so much for worshiping with us. Um, one of the ways that we worship is through the sharing of our testimony. It glorifies God and it encourages us as brothers and sisters. And so I want to turn it over to our good friend, Monica Morgan. Uh, we heard from John last week, her husband. And so Monica would like to share her story with us today. Church fam, my name is Monica Morgan, and I have been associated with Monterey Church since 2018 because of my amazing husband, John Morgan. Despite me being raised and continuing to be a practicing Catholic, I began attending service with Johnny because two of the main pillars in our marriage is that God is at the center of our marriage and it is important to practice our Catholic faith together. During this pandemic, I have been in a season of waiting. My season of waiting consists of four main points. John has already explained the craziness of our coast to coast to coast moves, but then there are the other three things. I am still waiting to heal from my grief over the loss of my mother passing away in November 2019 and the strained relationships of my sisters. I waited a total of 11 months before returning back to my work as an occupational therapist, and I am still waiting for my Johnny to come home. So here is what I've been learning. Just because my anxious Polish tendencies tell me nothing productive is happening, God continues to move in my life. He is working all things out. Cue the worship song, I Hate to Love, Yes I Will, by Vertical Worship. John has already mentioned the blessing of our extensive support groups from various places and backgrounds, so no I say ditto to that testimony. I have had to constantly remind my heart that God only has good plans for us, not to cause us harm. He placed our household in this amazing neighborhood, which reminds me of my childhood neighborhood. You know, the neighborhood where everyone talks over their fences, knows your face when you're walking by, and supports each other. To Jeremiah 29 11. Shout out to all my medical professionals who are grinding it out on the front lines. You will get my analogy concerning grief. I'm learning that grief resolution is not an antibiotic that you take for a certain set amount of time, and then you are cured from your ailments. Grief is a path you walk on and take on a daily basis. In other words, it will always be a chronic condition I have, but I can work to make the symptoms less agonizing and more manageable. The biggest thing I have learned is that rest is a good thing. It is not a sign of laziness or weakness. Resting has allowed me to learn my new settings in San Diego, absorb the beauty of his world, grow deeper roots in my relationship with him, and truly feel the joy and reckless love and trusting the Lord in his will. Cue Psalm 40. The beauty of this season has been God has not abandoned me. He wants me to come to him with the good, the bad, and the ugly. So how do I go to him? By taking time to rest and listen. This is difficult for a Polish woman who loves to talk. I listen closer by being intentional with my D group ladies and service attendants, both at Monterey Church and the Catholic Church community I found here. I listen closer by taking time to read daily devotionals, the Bible, and books on how to better understand and deepen my faith and prayer life. Cue A Praying Life by Paul E. Miller. And finally, I listen closer by taking intentional time to pray. This includes the Rosary, especially the Divine Mercy Novena, reading through the prayer wall I've created on the mirror in John's absence, and journaling with God. The overall lesson, seek God with a humble heart, He will provide. Q Matthew 6, 26 through 34, sending love and praying hedges of safety around my sailor and all those who serve in the United States military, and a heartfelt thank you to my Monterey Church family. I do not deserve the love and support you all give away so freely, but I will continue to do my darndest to make you proud of the sassy Polish Catholic woman I am. Love you all.
Hey, well, thank you, Monica and John, uh, for sharing your stories with us over the last couple weeks. We just, we love you so much, and we can't wait to sometimes see you very soon. Uh, well, let me introduce myself before we jump into the word here. My name is Mike. I am the teaching pastor here at Monterey Church, and I'm just excited for what the Lord is doing in and through our church. Though it looks completely different than what we imagined, and though we're going through just some major trials uh, in our life in different ways, the Lord is moving. He's working all this for His good, and uh, His Word is alive and active. And so I want to encourage you, before we jump in, let's all just prepare our hearts to see what the Lord just has in store for each of us today. Let's pray. Jesus, we... we we just love you so much. We thank you and praise you for who you are, for what you've done, and we thank you so much, Lord, for your word. We thank you, God, for uh, leaving us these instructions and these uh, directions that are just so alive, that it's not just historical information and knowledge for us to know, but it's truly... Uh, relevant for us to walk in right here, right now. So we just love you, we praise you, and thank you, and we look forward to all that you are doing through your spirit and through your word today. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said with me this morning, amen, amen. So um, listen, we're going to be in the book of Luke chapter 7 again. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn there. I'm going to be starting at verse 36 today. Uh, and we're going to be right back in our sermon series that we've been going through the last several weeks. How good is it really? Talking all about the good news of the kingdom of God. And so in this particular scene, what we see is Jesus actually teaching us all about the mercy of God. And I think this is important that we talk about the mercy of God because, you know, I think we can catch ourselves from time to time taking God's mercy for granted in our life. Or maybe you're someone that's like, I don't even know what you're talking about when you say the mercy of God. Maybe we're just unaware. And the reason why I think it's so important to talk about is because if we're unaware or if we, you know, forget the mercy of God, it affects the way that we worship Him. It also affects that we love others, which is exactly what we're called to do. Like the reason you and I are purposed for 2020 is to love God, is to worship God, is to glorify God, and is to love others as Christ first loved us. And so we're going to dig into God's Word here and just see how we can pull some lessons and some truths about His mercy and what that means for us. Let me give you a little bit of the context before we dive into verse 36. This is still, Jesus is uh, still in the beginning stages of His ministry. There's similar stories in uh, the other Gospels. Most scholars believe this is a significant story that kind of stands out on his own at the beginning of his ministry. Jesus is in Nain, the village of Nain. Uh, you would recognize that as we're continuing through the series. And, you know, at this point, Jesus has raised a widow's son back to life in that village. And so he's, he's a big deal around there. So it says in verse 36, one of the Pharisees, uh, a Pharisee, uh, this Pharisee's name was Simon, we'll learn here in a little while. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. Now, I want to stop because on the surface, we can read right through this little scripture. It feels like there's nothing significant there, but underneath the skin, as we peel back the layers, there's a lot to unpack, especially what we don't see Luke saying here. Uh, first, the Pharisee inviting Jesus to his home, that was not an impromptu invitation whatsoever. There is an agenda attached to that. Uh, we know that Simon, this Pharisee, he was a righteous or, you know, he claimed to be this righteous, prominent religious leader uh, in the village there. And he wanted to keep it that way. Like he was a powerful guy in that village. At the same time, here's Jesus who claims to be some sort of prophet who uh, Simon would have needed to investigate. And Jesus was also, of course, gaining all of this popularity. And it seemed like everywhere he was going, uh, there were these large crowds following him. And so he was gaining all of this 
influence. And so, you know, part of Simon's agenda inviting Jesus to dinner was simply to affirm his own prominence within his community. Like, hey, look who's coming to my house for dinner. At the same time, you know, uh, this is a means of Simon to just get some answers from Jesus to kind of, you know, to see what he's all about. What we also see is that Jesus, when he entered the home, there was no traditional greeting that happened. It was all ignored, which was a huge deal. It just says that Jesus went into the home and reclined to eat at the table. This is a big deal because traditionally, uh, it would have been expected for Simon to greet Jesus with a kiss, to offer Jesus water, to wash the dust off his feet, to anoint Jesus' head with uh, olive oil before the meal. Uh, this was the way that you know uh, someone would honor a guest, or even you know, especially a special guest like Jesus. It was a way to welcome them into a home. But Jesus receives none of it here. It would be like if I invited you to my house, but you know, um, you knocked on the door. I don't even. Maybe I didn't even let you in. Um, I didn't shake your hand. I didn't welcome you. Uh, I didn't um, offer to take your jacket. I didn't offer you a drink. I didn't turn off the TV or any sort of distractions. You're just there, right? You can imagine, it's the same sort of thing. You can imagine just how, uh, awkward and, uh, humiliating, um, and insulting that would have been for Jesus in that moment. It says in verse 37, when a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. So right around the same time that Jesus enters into this Pharisee's home, so comes this uh, immoral woman. She stumbles into the house. Uh, most scholars believe that she was a prostitute uh, in the area. And she's carrying this prized possession, this alabaster jar full of expensive perfume. Now, you can imagine being a fly on the wall in that scene, just how startling this would have been for Simon and his other guests, his other uh, Pharisee friends that were with him, because it was obvious here. It was obvious that she didn't belong. It was obvious that her presence would have been just an utter disgrace. She was the type of person uh, in her profession that righteous people like Simon and his Pharisee friends would avoid at all costs because everyone would have known, maybe even including this woman, everyone would have known that someone like her in her profession was unworthy of forgiveness. According to the Pharisees and from their perspective, what they taught is that forgiveness and holiness, a cleansing required contrition of the heart, it required confession, uh, and it required compensation, none of which they believed that this type of woman was capable of. And so she was labeled immoral. She was marked as a sinner, someone who was permanently diseased, someone who was permanently defiled and spiritually polluted. And so you can imagine when she stumbles in, right around the time Jesus comes in, they're all saying, what is she, what are you doing here? Like, why, why are you here right now? Well, uh, Jesus, again, this is the beginning of his ministry. There's, you know, he's taught a lot up until this point. He's been influential in the region. It's, you know, it's very possible that she would have heard of Jesus, heard about his teaching, the good news of the kingdom of God, that God loved even people like her, that God uh, loved unworthy sinners like her, that she may have heard that Jesus was this friend of sinners, that Jesus associated himself with those unworthy of forgiveness, that Jesus even ate at the same table as a sinner, that God, uh, through Jesus, had this authority to forgive her of her sin. That Jesus uh, gave her this opportunity to encounter God's mercy 
It was made available to her. And so she heard that, she responded to that in faith, and she came. She stumbled in, eager uh, to express her gratitude and her adoration to Jesus. It says in verse 38, Then she knelt behind him at his feet. Jesus, he would have been sitting at the table uh, and his feet would have been behind them or behind him. So he was like reclining at this table. It says she was weeping. Her tears fell on his feet and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. Now, I want us to stop there because we have to understand just how radical and unusual this would have been. I think that, you know, she may have had uh, an original intention to come in to meet Jesus and to anoint his head with this expensive perfume, but you know, from my perspective, it seems as though her emotions just overwhelmed her, they, that her emotions got the best of her, and so the tears just started flowing. That they landed on his feet behind him, and it was at that moment that it seems as though she must have been, or as if she was oblivious to everyone else in the room, Simon and all of the other Pharisees that were watching what was happening, she calls an audible and she lets down her hair in order to wipe the tears off of Jesus' feet. She kisses Jesus' feet. She pours this perfume, this expensive uh, perfume, her probably her greatest possession on his feet. Now, contextually, what we have to know is... Um, this would have been seen as extremely inappropriate. It, it would have led to uh, just shock and disgust anybody that would have seen it in that moment because to unbind her hair and to kiss his feet the way she did, especially the fact that she was probably in this uh, uh, profession, this would have been perceived as a seductive act as something you know, only a woman would do in the bedroom, certainly not in public. What's interesting is that as this woman was doing this, Jesus, what we see is he just, he just let it happen. Like he was, he was being passive. It says in verse 39, when the Pharisee, who had invited him, saw this, he said to himself, so he thought, if this man were a prophet, if Jesus were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. In other words, I can imagine Simon thinking in that moment, how dare you, Jesus? Like, what are you, some sort of client of hers? Like, how dare you come into my home? Who do you think you are allowing this infectious disease touch you in this way? If you were holy, if you were truly a prophet, if you were a righteous man like I'm a righteous man, you wouldn't touch this thing with a 10-foot pole. You see, what Simon didn't understand, though, in that moment, and as we've been working our way through Luke chapter 7, particularly what we know is that Jesus' compassion looks beyond merit, right? That where Simon saw her flaws, Jesus saw her faith. That Jesus was revealing to Simon the good news of the kingdom of God in that moment, that God's mercy knows no bounds. Period. That God's mercy knows no bounds, has no walls. That God's mercy was willing in that moment to disrupt the social order in order to identify with this woman who was a sinner. That God's mercy was willing in that moment to recognize her faith, to forgive her of even her greatest sin, 
that God's mercy in that moment was willing to reinterpret her actions as an act of humility, as an act of worship, and as an act of gratitude. Now, listen, I think we just have to pause and really take that in. That God's mercy knows no bounds. That this is a revelation of the good news of the kingdom of God. Not only for this woman, not only for Simon, but for you and for me. Someone needs to hear this today. Because there's people, there's someone on the other side of that screen. And I'm talking to you today that may feel like I have committed an unforgivable sin. Or I just feel unforgivable. I, you know, I hurt someone bad, or I've lied, I've cheated, I've stolen, um, I've, you know, I've had an abortion, uh, or I've funded uh, an abortion, um, or I, I've, uh, you know, um, or I've committed adultery. Listen, I want to remind you, this is a reminder for us today that Jesus didn't come to condemn you. Jesus didn't come to condemn you. He came to save you. That Jesus didn't come to call the righteous, someone like who's Simon, who was legalistic in all of his ways. Jesus came to call sinners to repentance. This is the, the mercy of God. And we see his mercy that is just so great. In in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, Paul says, Look, while we were still sinners, Christ even died for us. Like, that's the depth of his mercy here. That while we were his enemy, Jesus paid the ultimate price for you and for me, for our sin. He took on the weight of our sin, our greatest mistakes and failures upon himself to pay that price for us so that we don't have to pay it. It's Jesus' mercy. It's his forgiveness. It's his faithfulness that's endless, that's limitless, and that is for you today, friends. Now, we continue on. It says in verse 40, Then Jesus answered his thoughts as Simon was thinking. He said, Simon, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other, but neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and he said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here, Simon. When I entered into your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust off my feet. But she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss. But from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head. But she has anointed my feet with this rare perfume. In other words, who's the real host here, Simon? Who's the one that's really honoring and welcoming me here, Simon? Well, it's obviously not you. You, all you've done is tried to humiliate me, to insult me, to cast judgment in your own, you know, pious legalism. But here's this woman, this broken woman who's been labeled immoral, who's been labeled a sinner, who has humbled herself faithfully, humbled herself before me, even sacrificed like her greatest possession in order to honor me and to welcome me in this moment. Who's the real host here? It says in verse 47, I tell you, Simon, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So... Because she has been forgiven, she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, 
Your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said among themselves, Who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now, that's the story. Uh, That's the narrative. And um, what I'd like to do is kind of turn this around and really apply it to our life because, you know, we're all going through, you know, we're all struggling right now. Um, And I think we're all looking for ways to apply God's word, to walk according to his purpose for each of us right now. And so what I'd like to do is to look back and to focus on two lessons that Jesus taught Simon in that moment about God's mercy. And what we'll learn is once we encounter God's mercy, uh, it really truly affects our lives in two major ways, ways that we can certainly apply. The first way, the first lesson that Simon learns, and and please take some notes here, and start wrestling uh, with this as well. Um, the first lesson from Jesus to Simon here is that God's mercy moves us to worship. God's mercy moves us. It motivates us in our worship. This is what Simon saw from the woman. Jesus' mercy and his forgiveness, it led her to a place of deep repentance and adoration to God, a place where her heart and her mind and her actions were just all completely transformed, a place where now she worshiped Jesus above everything else in her life, above her shame, above her, uh, you know, all of her possessions, whatever she held materially, above her will. She worshiped Jesus above it all. It was his mercy that led her to that place of just humble adoration. You know, Paul talks about this response to God's mercy in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. He says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, not receiving what we deserve, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Listen, God's mercy spurs us to a radical lifestyle of worship. God's mercy spurs us to radical devotion. God's mercy causes us to put Him above everything else above our possessions, our opinions, our plans, our finances, our relationships, our education, everything, above it all. And you know, um, this is the type of thing that like really makes waves with the people around us. This is the type of thing that uh, uh, we've been purposed to do as the church to be the light of the world. Because when people see us worship, as these Pharisees saw this woman worship in that moment in such a radical way. And, you know, people will ask us, well, what are you doing? Like, don't you see what's going on around us? Why are you here? Like, why are you uh, participating in church, engaging in this thing? Like, why are you tithing? Why are you following Jesus? Why are you praying? Why are you singing? Why, you know, why are you, why are you doing this thing? That's where we say, look, you know, the world might be in all of this chaos and confusion, but the one thing that I know is that God is merciful to me. That God's mercy is made new every morning. That he's forgiven me of my greatest sins both past, present, and future, that he's faithful in his promises, that he's sovereign, that he's good, that he's working all of this for the good of those who are called according to his purpose, who love him. It's because of that mercy that I can't help myself but worship God above everything else. I can't help but myself but just point to Jesus. The mercy of God, it moves us in our worship. At the same time, God's mercy moves us to love others. God's mercy moves us to love others. This is a hard 
lesson that Simon learned from Jesus that day because Jesus knew Simon's heart, right? He knew what he was thinking. Simon's heart was exposed through his unloving and you know, arrogant and prideful attitude. That's why Jesus says in the latter half of verse 47, a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. And Simon, you know, he didn't know the love of God. He, he didn't know the mercy of God. And because he had never encountered the mercy of God, he looked down on someone like Jesus. He looked down on this woman. If Simon would have known the love of God, if he would have encountered God's mercy, maybe this scene would have looked completely different. I think this is critical for us to analyze because it's easy for us in today's climate to act like Simon, right? It's easy for us to have an attitude of uh, selfishness, of pride, of arrogance, even when we don't mean to. It's easy for us to look down on our neighbor or to look down on the people around us, to build up walls for our own comfort. It's easy for us to distance ourselves from people that we disagree with, maybe socially or politically. It's, it's easy for us to say hurtful things, right? Especially online. Like, I mean, it, it's so easy to type some words. It's, it's easy for us to say hurtful things behind someone's back. It's tempting for us to be, you know, impatient, to be unkind when we're in line or when we're driving or, you know, when we're with people around us that just irritate us. It's easy for us to be unforgiving. And when we do, it exposes a heart that is just forgotten or is taken for granted the mercy of God. And so, man, we need, to, we need to use this scene, this story, this lesson from Jesus as a means to repent, to turn back, and to remind ourselves all that God has done for us, that He is so rich in mercy towards you, that where, you know, though we were dead, like just gone, though we were dead, dead in our transgressions and our sins, though we were the enemy of God, though we had hurt God in so many ways, God made us alive through Christ Jesus, the perfect Son of Man, the perfect Son of God, sent to live this perfect, sinless life, to sacrifice Himself on the cross for the sins of the world, to raise to new life three days later so that you and I may be raised to new life as we put our faith, as we put our trust in Jesus. It's through the life of Jesus, it's through the ministry of Jesus that he calls his enemies his friends, that he cleanses us of all of our sin, that we know that you know Jesus' heart overflows with compassion for you that His mercy knows no bounds. And as we encounter, like as we really start to embrace and walk in that mercy, then it's that mercy that moves us to extend it to others. Like it's, it's God's compassion that leaks out from us where we are once you know, prideful and arrogant and selfish. As we focus and engage in God's mercy, now we're patient. And it's His Holy Spirit that helps us to be kind and forgiving and humble. And I'll tell you what, man, that's what the world needs. People who are representing Christ. People who are representing the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God. God's mercy knows no bounds. The Bible says in the book of Romans that there's nothing, there's nothing, hear me, nothing that can separate you from the love of God that is seen through Christ Jesus. Absolutely no mistake, no matter how far you've been, no matter what you've done to hurt others or to hurt God, His mercy knows no bounds. And it's through that mercy that we're moved posture our heart to worship Him in everything that we do, to live this radical, devoted life 
to Jesus, to be obedient to Jesus, to follow Jesus, and to love others as Christ first loved us. My prayer is like this woman, each of us would encounter the love of God. We put our faith and our trust in Jesus. Would simply have this conversation with God and would, you know, pray like, God, listen, I, I need to repent of my sin, turn from my ways, and I want to follow you for the rest of my life. Would you help me follow you, Jesus? I want to be devoted to you, Jesus, like this woman was devoted to you. At the same time, my prayer is that like Simon, we would apply these lessons of mercy because ultimately it's the mercy of God moving in and through his people, his church that will bring healing to a broken world. Let's pray together. Jesus, I love you. I thank you and praise you for just your word and for the reminders today of what you've done for us. Thank you for this story showing us this woman who turned to you, who was radically devoted to you, who gave everything over, and you just reminded us of your mercy here. That though she was a sinner, though uh, she had many sins, that you accepted her into your kingdom. And so we thank you, Lord, that we can relate with her here, that we can turn to you, put our faith and our trust in you, follow you for the rest of our life, that you've forgiven us, that you've set us free, that you've made us new and whole. At the same time, Lord, I, I pray your Holy Spirit would continue to um, lead us to a place of repentance, Help us to love others as you first loved us, where we may be looking down on others, where our attitudes may need a little bit of adjustment. Help us, dear Lord, to just focus on that mercy that you've given us first so that we may uh, pour out that mercy to the world around us. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, listen, um, I'm going to pass it off to... Hannah real quick with an announcement, but before we do that, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to all of those who are continuing to give financially through your tithes and your offerings uh, into the kingdom of God through Monterey Church. I know, I know that it is a step of faith every week. I know that it takes some courage, and so I'm so grateful for each of you who are continuing to just fund this ministry, you know, God is using your gifts to do some miraculous, crazy work uh, for the gospel. And so I want to thank you for that. Listen, I also want to encourage those that may be on the fence. Maybe you've been a part of our church for a while. Maybe you've been watching, um, you know, you would call Monterey Church your home in this season. Uh, if that's you and you haven't given, I, you know, I really... Just as a brother in Christ, I would encourage you to consider uh, starting to give, how the Lord is calling you to give, whatever that looks like. Because, you know, the Bible makes it clear that we can test Him in this, that as we give, God will open up the floodgates of heaven in our life and pour out so much blessing that there won't be room enough to, to contain, not only in your life, but in the life of the ministry that you're pouring into. And so I want to thank you for your gifts. Um, I want to pray just a blessing uh, and just for supernatural courage moving forward. And uh, I'm going to pass it off to Hannah to close. But let's just pray over um, our gifts. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you and praise you for um, just the opportunity to tangibly worship you. So, Lord, however, um, however you call us to give as we follow you know, this give link on each of our platforms as we're watching, and as we give throughout the week, whatever that may look like, would you bless it, Lord? And would you continue uh, to pour out that blessing that there won't be room enough to contain? We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
Hey everyone, I have two important announcements for you th today, so pay close attention. The first one is this Saturday, uh, November 21st, we are going to be having a picnic in the park at Colton Hall uh, on the lawn, and it's going to be at noon, and we're just really excited to create an opportunity uh, just to see each other, have some community, listen to some music. Um, we are not providing food, so bring your own picnic and a picnic blanket, um, and we'll just have a good afternoon, socially distanced and safe, um, but we're really excited to see you all. And that leads me to my second announcement, and that is about Operation Christmas Child. So, uh, as we've been talking about for the past couple of weeks, uh, the deadline to complete uh, packing those shoeboxes is this weekend. So, if you've picked up a shoebox from me, you can bring it to me on Saturday at the picnic. Um, I'd love to grab it from you there, or you can shoot me an email at hannah at monterey.church. Um, and we can arrange a time for you to bring it by the church. Um, also, you can still build them online, and that's an amazing, easy opportunity to do too. It's really fun, you can pick your items there, and it just costs $25. So our goal is still 200 shoeboxes, and we have a ways to go, but I have faith that we can do it. So please continue to pray about participating with us. Again, the deadline is this Sunday, November 22nd, um, and thank you to all of you who already have participated with us. Um, I hope you have a wonderful week, and we will see you Saturday at the park.